one of the things that I know about the power of film and the power of stories, it connects us to people in a way that we can't otherwise connect. And so this idea of empathy has sort of been swirling around everything that I do as a lawyer, as an advocate, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. And I've often found that people really don't understand. First of all, they don't understand exactly what empathy is and they don't understand the part it plays in storytelling and advocacy. And so I'm so happy to have Dr. Elizabeth Siegel with me for this podcast. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is, and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Dr. Siegel is a professor at Arizona State University. She is a master's in social work and a PhD in social welfare. And what's so intriguing about Dr. Siegel is that her area of study, her area of expertise is in, wait for it, social empathy. So welcome, Dr. Siegel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate your time. Uh, let me just ask you, what the heck is social empathy? And how did you get to be an expert in social empathy? So I'll tell you how I got there, and then I'll tell you what it is. How's that? Um, Perfect. So I spent many, many years of my career dedicated to studying inequality, social injustice, and then how we can create public policies that address those inequalities, um, particularly poverty, but all sorts of oppression and marginalization of groups. And I taught for years, I've written on it, and it's been a passion also. It's something I had probably from my childhood, which is part of the stories, because the stories of my parents. So, um, and about, oh gosh, about 15 years ago, I had this moment in teaching where I realized that for some of my students, no matter how much I brought facts and information and really taught them about how public policy can both oppress people but also can liberate people, can help people, can provide resources to allow people to fulfill a positive life. And um, it occurred to me that, that no matter how many facts I gave them, there was something deeper, some value, some belief that was blocking them from seeing the perspective of people who were in need. And usually it was from students who themselves were not, did not grow up in need. So they were having to make this jump and all this academic stuff didn't seem to, to, to hit. And I realized um, that it was something deeper and of course, I had training as a social worker in human behavior, but I hadn't really thought about empathy because my colleagues who do social work face-to-face -face worry about empathy, right? But here I am teaching public policy and how it impacts people's lives. And all of a sudden, I had this sort of moment where I think I need to understand how empathy applies on a larger scale. And so I came up with this idea of social empathy, although... <laughs> I didn't really know what it was because I also just, I, what I thought it was and what it has evolved into is the idea of using empathic insight about other groups, because we're talking larger than one-on-one, -on -one, using some kind of insight that relies on empathy to understand what would be best public policy-wise, social programs, what do, we, what do people need who live in different ways than we do? And usually those who have the power to make decisions, have resources, are different for the, from those for whom they're making those decisions. And if they don't get it, then we have mismatched intentions and worse than that, mismatched policies. And we see that all the time. And the other piece of it that has frustrated me my whole career is when we produce some kind of program or policy to help, and I put that in quotation marks, help people who are less fortunate, and then it fails, who gets the blame? 
we blame those for whom we developed the program. Instead of looking back and saying, you know, maybe that wasn't a good idea. And I have examples of that that I use in my teaching. So it occurred to me that this empathy thing is a big deal. And it is even a big deal, not just the one-to-one, but on a much larger scale. Let's, let's back up and go super, super basic. Because I have a feeling that uh, for the seven people that are going to end up listening to this podcast, um, just kidding. I know there are thousands of you out there already. Um, but that a lot of people don't get what empathy is. And you mentioned this idea of the pity party, and, and I, think a, I think a lot of people confuse the, the ideas of sympathy and empathy. And so could we just break it down and tell me how you would define empathy and then maybe even distinguish that from the concept of sympathy? Good point. So empathy in a general sense is the ability to take the perspective of another person and while doing that, be clear that it's the other person's experience, not your own, and then using that to gain insight into what their, their life or their moment that you're empathizing with is experienced. What it's not is feeling bad for them, although you might, but that's not empathy. So sympathy suggests that it suggests several things sympathy suggests that someone is going through a bad thing or a hard time and if you have sympathy for them you're not going through that bad time in the same way and so you feel for them but you really feel bad for them you worry about them but you don't imagine what it's like to be them You're not putting yourself, and here's the tricky part with empathy. With empathy, when you put yourself in the shoes of someone else, you're then trying to see what their circumstances are from their eyes. What we often see is either sympathy, where you just feel bad for them, or you empathize, but you really interpret the situation from your experience. So for example, when I worked with people who were poor, um, I might see work with a mother who has three kids, who are three different fathers, we don't know where the fathers are, and her life is chaotic, and there's not enough money, and the baby's crying and needs the diaper changed, and I'm getting all, and I'm trying to see it from her perspective. But what I have to be careful of is that when I see it from her perspective and I understand this chaotic life and lots of needs, I start saying, well, why is she letting the baby, you know, I would never let the baby cry like that. I would jump up right now and change the diaper. Well, I'm probably thinking that because I have a stack of diapers clean or bought from the store that I can do that because I'm of a middle class means. She may not have any more diaper. I don't know. I don't know her situation. But what I have to be careful of, and that's what happens when we do home visits and social work, is that I don't bring my sensibilities and my experience into the other person's situation. Does that make sense? Yes. So empathy is really hard. Yeah. (laughs) It's not at all easy. And I don't think it's a straight line. I think one day I can be very empathic. And then another day, I just had a bad day, or I'm tired, and it's really hard for me to see your point of view. So I started studying it, and then it was actually in 2008, because I was blessed to have a sabbatical, which sometimes we get, and I was going to write my new book that was going to be called Social Empathy, and I wasn't really sure what it was. And I started doing reading, and I realized I don't know really much about empathy. And in fact, I don't really understand it, because that area, that intrapsychic stuff, that wasn't my expertise. So I had a colleague and a dear friend who was also on sabbatical, and we would meet once a week for breakfast. And I'd say, and I said to her, can you help me out? I know you're the psych person. She was doing other projects. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll read up, I'll see what's out there, and I'll call you. And you know, when we have our breakfast in another week, we'll, we'll touch base. Two days later, she calls me. Oh my God, oh my God, you're not gonna believe this. There's all this brand new neuroscience research out there on empathy. Social work doesn't know anything about it. Psychology, is touching it, but really it's these neuroscientists and they don't have the macro or the social policy, the human behavior. We social workers think broader in environment. They're not doing it. She said, oh, this is so interesting. So one thing led to another and we were gonna, and she said, 
I said, will you collaborate? She pushed her other project to the side and we started collaborating on figuring out what this is. And literally reading, oh my gosh, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, social neuroscience, about things that I had no idea and I still struggle with, but I've been reading a lot of it over the years. Mm -hmm. And my, my colleague Karen was so good at this that we just would have discussions every week, like look what I read and look what I found out. So can I step back and say neurologically what we know empathy to be? Yes. So based on all this new research, and, and a, a lot of psychologists in their testing suggested this, but you don't know what's going on in the brain until you can see it or measure it. And neuroscientists, starting in really just about 15 years ago, accidentally came upon through mo research on monkeys that there are components of the brain that light up differently for different parts of empathy. Are we getting to mirror neurons Yes, now? we are. Oh, goody. Okay. Yes. So my favorite story with mirror neurons and, and where they actually started was that in the lab, you may know this, in the lab of scientists in Italy, they, were, they had macaque monkeys with their brains wired, okay? Because you can't really do that to human beings because you can't leave these electrodes on for ages. And they were testing different parts of the monkey's brain when they were doing tasks. And the story goes, and I've seen it written in multiple places, so I think it's pretty accurate. But the story goes that they were taking a lunch break in the lab, and one of the lab tech, and one of the things the monkeys had worked with were peanuts, although I've seen it also as bananas. I've heard different, I've seen different versions. But one of the versions that, that one of the staff, the lab guys was just eating some peanuts because they had them around. Yeah. And they were eating the peanuts, and as he was cracking the peanut, the monkey's brain waves went off as if the monkey was cracking the peanuts, except the monkey wasn't doing anything and it was break time. It wasn't, you know, they weren't really measuring anything. Wow. And that's what clicked them like, wait a minute, the monkey's brain is thinking it's opening peanuts, which it knows how to do and does, but it's not. It's watching one of the lab people. That's where mirror, that was the beginning of saying there's something in the brain, mirror neurons is what they then name them or some of them call them is that there's some neurological ability in our brains that we mimic as if we are doing it but we're not we're just seeing it and so coming from a perspective of what i do my, my primary focus in the law because i'm a filmmaker mm -hmm. is visual advocacy yes i mean we lawyers we're great at talking that's what we do but i i say we need to show not tell Yes. And by using pictures in, in our pleadings or making short documentary films to show to a judge or a jury, there's something about seeing that makes those, those mirror neurons light up as opposed to some other form of communication? Well, the, f the first piece is that we're probably hardwired, or even if it's evolution, we're hardwired to mimic, to mirror. And it makes complete sense because if you go back evolution or just survival if if we didn't understand each other you know human beings the baby an infant born needs lots of years before it can take care of itself we're a species that's highly labor intensive and a lot of the mirroring is that if two things if the the baby cries and doesn't elicit some kind of mirrored reaction from the caretaker even though the, the mother or father may not cry they feel like crying because they're struck by this mirroring, they're gonna to attend to the infant more. So it's a calling over of pay attention to what's happening in a way that's appropriate because you're responding to my crying as if you were gonna cry means you're more likely to feed me, cuddle me, bait, you know, warm me up, whatever it is. You have mm -hmm. to figure it out, mm -hmm. it takes going back and forth. At the same time, what do we always do with babies? We like lean over and go, oh, look at you, you're so cute, and we smile. And what we're hoping unconsciously is that they'll smile back at us, right? Because yeah. then we engage. So the mirroring is probably the, one of the most basic connections we can make that's important. So what you're talking about for, for telling people stories, absolutely, because it, it strikes at one of our most basic ways of connecting as human beings. Now, the, the good thing about the neurological research is you're absolutely right, Doug, that, that pictures, store, seeing is a visual way of triggering mirroring. But we also know, which is very good for storytelling, is that we've seen the same brain waves 
So if I describe to you eloquently the cracking of a peanut, the taste of it, your brain might still start to imagine the feeling of cracking a peanut open. So that we, it, it's a little harder with something as simplistic as a peanut. But if I tell you a story that is particularly visually imagined in your brain, once you imagine it, you also can trigger the mirror neurons to feeling it. That's why when we go to a movie, or not even a movie, we read a good book. So no one's, you don't see any pictures. Why am I crying at a book? It's just words on a page. Because the book described something that I'm visualizing. It's called affective mentalizing. I'm mentalizing it. And then it's triggering okay. my feet mirroring. So, so I, think the, I think the takeaway there is if you don't have access to the visuals and you are relying on speaking or the oral tradition, storytelling, and that, that the goal is to use descriptive language. Exactly. Paint word pictures, transform somebody, put them in the moment. Exactly. Assuming that the brain is operating the way it's supposed to, um, that's a great entrance way. Here's the hard part about empathy. That's not the whole picture. There's also parts of empathy that are more likely developed cognitively, that are learned. So, so pe some people can have a reaction. So someone's crying and you start to cry because you're so emotionally linked affectively. But then you go off and start crying and thinking about what happened to you when you were little and oh, how terrible it is. And you like totally miss the other person. That's not empathy. So what the neuroscientists argue is that there's further components that they see light up in the brain and they light up in different parts. That's why we call them components, that they're different. That's the hard part also about empathy. There's not an empathy spot. Mm. This is what makes it really complicated. So these components, we have the, what we call the affect of that physiological reaction, the mirror neurons. You might even move it into a little bit cognitive by mentalizing in your own brain what it might look like but then come the parts that really put empathy into play in an active way and that is what the cognitive parts and there's three parts that we we consider in our model that most neuroscience has identified it's, some neuroscientists focus more on the physical some on the cognitive but based on all the literature there are three cognitive components and that is self other awareness that there, we understand there's two of us in this dance, that they're your feelings, my feelings. I get that you're having feelings, I'm having feelings, but you keep them separate. In, in our professional world, we call it boundaries. But self-other awareness, perspective taking, just what we think it is, that you take another person's perspective. But remember what I said, you're taking that person's perspective. You're not bringing your own eyes into their life situation. Perspective taking. And then the third piece is something we call emotion regulation. And that is that you're not getting overwhelmed or you're not getting too caught up. I, 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 one of the most difficult things for us as professionals is that piece of emotion regulation because you can get caught up in a very difficult life story of someone else and you feel it so much you go home and you're just, you know, oh, I've got to, I can't deal with this. And, and that's where burnout in a lot of helping professions. Yeah. So. So when you get all those parts going, you're 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 cooking. It, you're cooking. You got yeah. inter, and that's what what I call interpersonal empathy. I mean, it's one on one or in a small group. Then through my research and the work I've done with my team, if we how do we transfer that on a larger scale? And so we came up with through research and through testing it out, two other components, and they mirror not to, wait not to use the mirror ring, but uh -huh. they, they reflect the interpersonal. And one of them is what we call macro self-other awareness and perspective taking. We kind of package them as one, this macro perspective taking and getting that my group self-other awareness is not self, but like my group is different than your group and that's okay. And then I'm going to take your position anyway. And it's much larger. And you build that on a diff one other component, which is contextual understanding. And that's the part that I'm, I think we social workers bring, is that every context is different. And when I say contextual understanding, it's not just understanding what's going on in that person's life, but what may have happened historically um, that's embedded in cultures 
that we need to recognize. So we have so much going on in this country about race and Black Lives Matter and all sorts of other issues that are really, really important. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, why do we have to keep bringing that up? Or, oh, we solved that problem. We had civil rights. You can't ignore historical context. And so social empathy would say, doesn't matter that it happened hundreds of years ago. If it has an impact today, we need to try to understand it. Mm. Is there a legacy? Is there something carried over? And that those pieces, when you do that macro perspective taking and think contextually, but way beyond just this community, well, how does this community fit into this into the city? How does the city fit into this state? How does the state fit in? You know, I mean, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but you you understand things better. And then you can be more empathic, I think, on all levels. Let, let me just pose my my um, great obstacle to to building the bridge of empathy in my cases, be it with a opposing counsel, with a judge, with a jury. They may not have ever seen or tasted a peanut in their life. Exactly. Um, so how, how, I mean, to what end, so we can measure someone's empathy or we can, you know, we, we have these great concepts of empathy, but we know that, that there's an empathy gap in our culture and in, on a micro and a macro level, we, we, we encounter these barriers to empathy all the time. How do we break down the barrier? That's a question. Like, how do we fit? How do we, how do we build the bridge of empathy with others, especially if they've never eaten a peanut? Okay, so you're raising the question, um, and we're still working on it, but I'll, I'll tell you the best I can how to respond. So say you're talking to a judge. The judge has more than likely never lived a life like most of the, your clients, right? Right. Okay. And in today, which I think is where we've evolved demographically and in the United States history over the past 50 years, it's even more likely that a judge or maybe an attorney or someone who's very professional and well established may have no contact other than a passing service person that they don't even recognize as another person with people who are different than them. So now we have the peanuts are really getting them to understand peanuts is really a problem because they don't ever see them. They don't ever eat them. They don't even know where they come from. So that's hard. What we can do, and this is why your storytelling and pictures are so important, is to paint a picture and then say, okay, judge, is this where you, do you have a daughter or a son? Yeah, I have a son. Would you want your son at the age of eight living in this environment? My son would never live there. No, no, that's not the question. I mean, you know, I don't know how you're supposed to talk to judges carefully, um, but. <laughs> Very carefully. But, but, but that, that's what I do with my students. I say, you're right. Okay, she should have taken more responsibility. He, he, why did he not stay in school? Why did he drop out? Fair enough. If I can paint you a picture of, let's say, the school, kindergarten through sixth grade, that that young person went to, here's the picture. Would you go to school there? Would you send your child there? Here's the, the thing that fascinates me in our society. Most people, when you get them as a parent or in terms of their own choices in life, they know they don't want to live in public housing high rise. Why? They know they don't want to send their kid to that school. It takes them one second to look at a school and say, I'm not sending my kid there. Why? So if you won't send your kid to that school, why are we sending someone else's kids to that school? Do your kids get better schools? And if they say, yes, my kids are entitled to better schools, you have a different argument. But if they say, well, well, I wouldn't send it. No, no one should have to go to a school in Arizona that has no air conditioning. That's ridiculous. You're right. So why do we send other kids there? It's putting, it's the perspective taking, but not with judgment. It's putting yourself in someone else's shoes as if you were sending your own child to that school or you had to go to that school. Because I, I think we judge situations all the time pretty well, whether we want to physically enter into that place or that relationship. or we, 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 we use our empathic insights in some ways, but we, don't, we use them more as a preservation, a self-guiding tool, but we don't necessarily put ourselves in the position of other people from their perspective. 
So the ways that you can get in a courtroom in a, or in any kind of, of professional dialogue, so, so your struggle is with judges and other lawyers. My struggle is with policymakers. Politicians, the vast majority of politicians elected have no idea what people live like for whom they make laws all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have some really, really mean, I think mean-spirited, but really bad laws. Because you've got, I, I did a little study years ago on welfare reform, and um, I looked at all the voting members of Congress on, so because I had done, studied welfare since my PhD. I've been studying it for decades. I'm doing all this research. And in 1996, we get this, do you remember ending welfare as we know it? And I'm distraught because yeah. it's like not just ending welfare it's as I know it. 20 years since, since yeah. the welfare reform bill. I know. Well, I'm feeling pretty yesterday. old. Yeah. Okay. And that was the, President Clinton. Yes, yes, it was. And it was, it was really punitive from my perspective and my research. Well, the vast majority of recipients of welfare at that point, somewhat true, were single women, young single women, average age about 30, with two children on the average age of seven years old. So it's a single mom, young, with little kids who did not have more than a high school education and was obviously poor. The people voting on that bill and making it just in Congress that year, the average age was 55 white male who were we know wealthy because the going rate of income at that point just for a member of Congress was close to, you know, it was 150,000 in those days. And some like 30% of members of Congress are millionaires at that point. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, the, and then of course, all of them had advanced degrees. I mean, they were not even on the same planet. <laughs> right. And they were passing this. And so their attitude was, well, she should work. Well, a 30 year old, an average age of many of them were in their 20s with, no, maybe a high school degree, with two little kids at home. Working all day, what do we do with the kids? Yeah. And what job is she going to get that gives her the health insurance that you now are taking away because it was, a, and, and food stamps. I mean, the whole thing right. was ludicrous. I, I get the point of wanting people to work. And the worst part of it that really, this is what put me over, is that up until that point, you could go to college and still get public assistance. You could actually enroll in college and get real training for maybe a better job and still have kids and go on welfare. That legislation cut out the opportunity to go to a four-year university. They oh, took wow. that away from women. That. So it was worse than just, you wow. should go work. We don't count... We're not going to count going to college as work. Wow. So it was, from my pers that's what yeah. probably, as my sister always says, that really pissed you off, didn't it? And that really, that's, in retrospect, what started me on this journey of something is really out of whack here. Wow. Yeah, and by the way, work means often minimum wage, which is $7 and change. And you talk about empathy, I cannot wrap my mind around how you live a life making seven dollars and whatever it is seven and a quarter an hour for your work and then no health care to, to boot with two kids with two kids and then it's, here's the worst part how many of those members of congress were voting for that and at the same time talking about family values and how important it was for parents to be there for their children right. so the single mom is now kicked out of the house because she's got to go look for a job at yeah. seven dollars an hour if she finds it the two kids are being taken care of by whom? Yeah. And now, so now not only are they not working enough, but they're bad moms because mom work isn't work. Yeah. So the whole thing, I mean, you can see I still get annoyed about maybe. It, it's infuriating. Um, did you ever see the documentary Street Fight uh, about Cory Booker's run for mayor of no. New York? Amazing mo movie. But one of the things he did is he actually moved into a housing project in Newark in like the worst area of town and lived there for like a year, like literally lived there. And so now he's a United States Senator. This is a guy who knows. What, exactly. Who knows, you know? You know, it, it's these things sometimes sound hokey, but I don't buy for a minute that they're hokey. If, unless, you, you know, you do it for a minute that... So Greg Stanton, our mayor, this was two years ago, he did the food stamp challenge. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't hear about this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I give him credit. He didn't make it into his platform and, you know, but, but and he literally, and he, he's, he's the kind of mayor who probably gets a lot of the peanut stories. You know, he gets it. 
but he did the the food stamp challenge is um you know where where you live for a week or a month on a food stamp allotment to spend your money on food and his comments it's worth looking up online you know his comments are like of course i knew they were poor but i didn't know it was this bad and yeah. i couldn't get this and i was getting hungry and i you know i mean and and my sister tells the story i don't remember it she's older than me that when food stamps was first developed my mother decided that she was going to have us on a food stamp diet for a month, you know, a week or a month. You know, that she thought that our family, my mother was this housewife, stayed home, but she was radical in her own way. And she was like, you know what, we need to know what it's like. And my sister tells me that we didn't last more than two days. Like beans, beans and rice? We don't eat beans and rice every meal. What's going on here? And that it was that kind of learning that, so I'm really very much, in, I mean, I, I don't want to, I want to be careful that people who live like that, you know, who that's their real life, don't feel made fun of or taken advantage of that we're, you know, because I get to go home. But when people do that, it's very, very powerful. Yeah. And the more, and I wish we could get more and more people in places of power to somehow have that experience or at least get an insight a little bit more so. Yeah. I had an experience recently where I was with a client. We were actually filming something for his sentencing, and I wanted to ride with him to work. He worked a minimum wage job, so we drove in his old minivan while he drove and I filmed. And then I was going to drive his van back home because it's a one-car family, and his wife needed it to take her kids around. And um, we were, it was very low on gas, so I went to the gas station to put some gas in the car and it just dawned on me so here's a guy who's making minimum wage and it cost me like 40 some dollars to fill up this tank he would have had to work almost a full day of work just yes. to put a tank of gas in the car um the things that we take for granted i don't know how people do it to be honest with you you're right so going back to your students because you you said that's what sort of motivated you to, to go down this road of empathy in the first place that they just weren't getting it and the facts and the statistics all that don't they don't penetrate that shell um, so now that you've done this research you have the assessment tool you know so much more about it uh, are you have you been able to put any of that into practice and are you seeing any results in getting through to those folks. Well, one thing I've done is almost all my assignments now, even at the graduate level, have either an experiential component or a mentalizing experiential component. So I don't, I don't have them do, not that this isn't a good thing, but traditional research papers. Um, I have assignments where, okay, you have to go apply for public assistance. And, and, I, and I tell them, you know, I don't want you to lie but I'd like you to experience it as much as possible. Um, I have them try to, try to open a bank account, cash a check without a bank. So, so ignore that you have a bank, now go cash a check. And I've had incredible stories where students come to me. One of my favorites was a student um, who probably got it, but she was, I would say middle class, Native American. And she, she said, you know, I, I decided to go to the, you know, Acme check cashing. And it was after work. My husband picked me up and I thought, oh, you know what? I'll just have him sit in the car while I do this because this assignment was so easy. I was just going to go in there. And she said, well, when I started asking, and, and they have questions they have to ask, like how much is the interest going to be that most people don't because they're desperate, but I wanted them to learn. So she's got this personal check from like her mother that she's going to go cash. And she said, and my husband was in the car and the car was running and all of a sudden they started looking at me. They're looking out at my husband. She said, I think they thought I was going to rob something. And it, it freaked her out that luckily we processed in class that here she was trying to experience what it was like. And then she all of a sudden got hit by all the stereotypes, people of color, who's that man waiting for you? Are you going to rob us and jump into the car? And she had this amazingly difficult experience but at the same time, she, even somebody who, she was middle class and had a bank. And she said, wow, that was potent. A lot of my students who, white students, go into these check cashing places and they're the only white person there. And I've, I, now, I don't force them. They have options. They can go apply for public assistance. And many of them sit in a waiting, I tell them, go sit in a waiting room in a public assistance office. Just go sit. Unfortunately, today, a lot is done online. 
So that experience, that one, um, I've told them go try to rent an apartment without a job, see what that's like. So you think a lot of the public assistance things are done online? Yeah, I didn't. Okay. My stu- Doesn't that presume that folks Yes, are and so I get <laughs> students who will write a paper and say, you would not believe how hard this was. That I went online, could barely understand it, and I'm a college, I'm a graduate school. Yeah. I'm in first year graduate school. I'm supposed to know how to use a computer, and then they walk away and go, "Wow." Yeah. But you can tell them, oh, you know, 52 percent of people whose income is below X doesn't have a computer, whatever. But make them have to figure out how to do it exactly. Um, so I've done that. I use like movies or books. So I'll I have them do a book critique, but they're all sort of trade market books. The, 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 they're books more about, and I like to find, mostly journalists write them, stories. So stories of people on welfare, stories of people who um, immigrated undocumented. Mm-hmm. And so that they least enter into a person's life. Mm-hmm. So I'll put you on the spot since we're podcast about telling stories. Um, you've told, you've already told some about really, because I just feel like in life there are some people that get it and some people that yeah. haven't gotten there yet. And they'll get there, but they they don't they haven't gotten there yet. You're more optimistic than I am. I'm not <laughs> sure. Some I would like to think everyone will get there. I'm not sure. Yeah, well. But I appreciate that's your the dream. That's yeah, the dream. and that's what we're working that's towards. That's what we're working for. That's why we're sitting here having this conversation. Exactly. But um, what is there any other you know like in your or especially in your formative years like why do you think you chose this path. I mean, even before you got deep, deep into studying empathy, you were about helping people who didn't have the same kind of resources that you had. Like, how do you get there? I'm convinced that just by the draw of genetics, I happened to grow up in a household with two adults, two parents, who both grew up poor. So they were transcending cultures, so to speak. I mean, they grew up poor and were becoming middle class. So, and there is research that suggests that people who are who are less powerful, poor, tend to be more multi bicultural in the sense that if you're poor and you want to make it in the United States, you better learn how to speak rich people language, or at least, you know, professional language. But if you're a professional and you grow up with resources, why do you need to talk like poor people or other cultures. So so people on the margins often have to speak both languages. And you know, we know sometimes that's friction like people, you know, you're selling out and why are you talking to like the man? But they they learn two languages because you'll get fired from your job if you don't behave by the criteria of this middle class or upper middle class professional world. So I had the advantage of parents who had to speak both languages because they were struggling and they raised kids and wanted to make it. So, so that starts there. The story I tell you about my mother, my father told stories our whole lives. And I was just um, working on my other book, my social empathy book. That's what I'm working on now, writing. And I came across an article that talks about how if you can, you know, how do we, this is obvious, but it was, it was, the story was getting two different cultures to understand each other. And the best way is to get them to, to connect in a way that they have similarities. Like what's the story? And so I'll tell you, it's a story that my father told me all the time growing up that I just realized was an empathy story. And I didn't know it till just two days ago. And um, so my father, my father, I told you, was in World War II, and he enlisted, was patriotic, and ended up being in the Army for almost five years, and part of that was training to go over to Europe and land in the beaches of Normandy. And my father told stories, and I have a lot of them, thank God, on tape, because he's passed away, and that's another book to write down the road, but that's a different one. And he told many stories, so he, and he landed in Normandy, survived, Um, and fought in the Battle of Bulge, all these famous things we'd heard, and he was captured. He was a German prisoner of war. And luckily my father, he told the stories with such ability. Um, Looking back, I'm thinking, what about the post-traumatic stress? But that's another story. My, My dad was a real survivor, and he also was an optimist. So he told a lot of stories. So one story he told me was a story about when he was a prisoner and it was towards, they knew it was the, the war was winding down because they were marching the prisoners now away from both fronts because the Germans were losing. And um, my father also, 
grew up in a fa- in a household that spoke Yiddish. So being Jewish, growing up, I mean, he was born in the United States, but his grandparents and his parents spoke Yiddish. So he had what we would call, to the Germans, broken German. So he was a prisoner, but he could speak some German. So every once in a while, they might be, they were stopped in a, in a, on a farm in a field, and every once in a while, they'd grab some prisoners and say, you're going to go work for this farmer for the day. So he got pulled off, and he said he went to work for the farmer. And as he was working, the wife, the farm wife, was, was making potato pancakes. Mm. And he said, you know, we're starving. I'm smelling this potato pancake. I, I be- you know, every bit of food is, is survival. And he smelled it. And so he looked around, and he happened, the door was open, and he happened in his broken German to say, in, and, and he says it in German. I, I don't speak German, but he, would, he said, my grandmother was in Hamburg, which we know is a city in German. And then he said, and my grandmother made potato pancakes. And the woman looked at him, and she looked around, and she gave him a potato pancake, which probably saved his life for at least you know several weeks. Mm-hmm. What with the story and why this was so important in my family is that my father did not lie. His grandmother was in Hamburg. She didn't live in Hamburg. She wasn't from Hamburg. Actually, the family story is when they were leaving Eastern Europe in the late 1800s, it took, you know, it took months to get to America. They stopped in Hamburg. And his mother also, his grandmother also made potato pancakes because Jews from Eastern Europe made potato pancakes. He didn't lie. But what I realized from that story is my father, for survival, had figured out how to connect with this woman in a way that was very personal. Speaking broken German, having a grandmother who was from Germany, but not really, and who made the same thing that this woman was making. And the thing is, when the farmer came in and realized what his wife had done, he was furious because it could have gotten them in trouble. And why are you giving this American prisoner war, our food? They didn't have much. So it was not a safe thing for her to do anyway. And I've heard that, I had heard that story for years, and it was one of these stories where my father, we just marveled at how smart he was, you know, because he was figuring out how to survive. But he was tapping into making an empathic connection. And then we know now know from research and neuroscience has documented our brain waves that when you connect something in a personal way that speaks to that person, you can bridge, and in this case it's probably it certainly helped my father greatly, if not saved his life. Yes. I love that story. I, you know, and I have to tell you, I've been studying empathy for years and I've known that story for decades. Yeah. I read this fancy schmancy article yes two days ago, and I just said, "Oh my God, that's my dad's story," and so that's how. But but what I think back is maybe not consciously, but unconsciously, my father was teaching me learn other people's language, learn their and language. I don't mean just the words. Learn how they live, connect with them. And when I think back on it, my father. I mean, it embarrassed the hell out of us as kids. Every time we, we lived in Chicago, we grew up in Chicago, and there were ethnic restaurants every corner of Chicago, and we'd go try different ones. And my father would ask everyone who were, where are you from, what language you speak, and then he would want, insist on learning something, or he knew. I mean, he taught me the one Polish phrase he knows, which is, give me a kiss, daj mi buzi. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't even need that ever in my mm-hmm. life, but he would you know, joke with a waitress. He just, he commute, and I was watching that growing up. Now, if you don't have... I, a lot of my empathic abilities, and I need a lot of work to do, I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect, it's from my parents. And where did they get it? I guess from their parents. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it, I think all of us to survive need to, you will survive better if you are more empathic. As a baby and as a, and a, and as a caretaker of a baby, the survival mechanism kicks in with mirroring. If you wanna, you know, you go to school as a little kid, if you can sort of understand what your teacher's looking for, you do better at school. If you get what the kids, you understand how to fit in with the kids, you're reading people all the time. Yeah. So being empathic, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is the lifeline of our society. And when we excel, we do great things. And when we don't act empathically, we see, and the worst cases are you know, genocide. When we, when we are able to dismiss on a macro societal level empathy, or we miss it, and there's I think you can also dismiss it. But before we wrap this up, so I 
Whenever I do an interview of any kind, with anyone, in any setting, in any form, I always find it useful to ask, what did I forget? Is there something on your mind about yeah. empathy that I didn't ask you that you really want to talk about? I'm glad you did, because as you were talking, I thought, oh, wait, I forgot. So um, I think that one of the pressing questions today is how do we have, some people have empathy and some don't. And what do we do about that? And so what I, what I just wanted to say is that um, I'm operating from a slightly different perspective that empathy is really hard. And I, so I don't want people to walk away and say, oh, I, now I have to be empath, now I have to care about everybody. And I, in a, oh, how do I word this? It, it's, it's something that we should strive for, but I, I recognize it's really hard and it isn't that those, those who are empathic are better, I mean, they do often things that are really good for society. Um, and that I do think it's an evolution. And I think that my last piece is that I'm beginning to look at how hard it is to be empathic when you yourself are worried about your survival. So in we that's the social empathy piece, that we owe it to people to not have to worry about day-to-day -day survival, and not just here, I'm talking about in the world. Um, because when, when, when you are frantic about your survival, it's very hard to take other people's perspective. Mm -hmm. And rather than feel like I'm empathic, I'm a good person, someone else isn't, they're a bad person, is, are there, is there safety? Is there preservation, their self-preservation protected? Because if it's not, it's going to be awfully hard for them to feel empathic. And, and I say that because I've, I've looked back on my own life and I remember when I was struggling and you know, I didn't have a lot of money and I was trying to, before I became the professional that I am now, I don't think I was all that as empathic as I could have been. And I know why, because it's like, well, you know, I, need, I need enough money for rent and I can't worry about other people. And so I think that, that when we recognize, and this goes back to your question, why should I pay taxes for all these people who don't do anything? Well, if empathy really, as, as the primatologist and biologist Franz de Waal says, it's the glue that holds society together. It's what makes us human beings and connects us. It is in my best interest and in your best interest to make sure people are, are feeling safe enough in their lives that they can then be empathic instead of worrying about survival and me, 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 me. So it... Uh, my tax dollars to help others to feel more secure will actually contribute greater to society and I will get back what I put in. Does that make sense? That sort of... It makes total sense. And it's, it's, it's sort of ironic. It's almost like uh, self-interested empathy. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. That's a perfect way to say it. But it makes sense. I mean, you said it earlier. It's a survival technique. We, that's why we empathize in a lot of ways. Right. So survival is about self self-interest but we we get there by helping others and and it is it is not easy so don't don't feel bad if on a given day you're not all that empathic it's a lot of work it, it it's it we are hardwired for the foundation of it but to fully engage in empathy takes a lot of work takes a lot of mental training and some of some of us get it from a young age so we kind of fall into it which is great um, but for some people, it's going to take a little more work. And we always need brush-up courses. I'm so glad that we ended on that note. I mean, it really is my, my, my deepest hope for this project, this podcast, that um, we're going to help people do that hard work. So thank you so, so much for being here. And Thank this you. Was incredible. I learned so much. I, I'm, I'm thinking we're probably going to have to talk again. <laughs> I would love to. I can talk about this for hours. So okay. thank you. When Thank you very much. But thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. That's it for today. But before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. 
I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign off on a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What, what's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.